All right, welcome to uh, the chapter on photosynthesis. So this this part or segment is going to just kind of introduce you to photosynthesis, and we're going to kind of discuss uh, what are the two major phases of photosynthesis, and then some important things to know before we get into the details of the process. Now, uh, from remembering from chapter six, you know already that photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplasts. Remember, chloroplasts are an organelle, uh, which is in plant cells and also some other types of cells. And we'll kind of talk about that in just a moment. Now, photosynthesis is in general a process in which allows organisms to take light or solar energy and convert it to chemical energy like sugars. Now, indirectly or directly, uh, photosynthesis is, uh, requ is required by a number of types of organisms. So there's a lot of organisms that kind of depend on this process. Now, directly, if they depend on this process, would be an example of plants, right? So plants depend on this to basically create sugars, which they will use to uh, build other things and also use for energy. Indirectly, there are a lot of organisms like these beetles right here, which require photosynthesis because they are, as you can see, eating the leaves. Inside the leaves are the sugars, right, that the plant actually produced. So uh, there's organisms that actually eat the sugars that are produced by um, it's important to know uh, the terms that are used for these types of organisms. So uh, those organisms that can undergo photosynthesis so they can do that process are called autotrophs. Auto means self and trophic means like a nutritional category. So here an autotroph is a self feeder. So these, these are actually considered the producers of the biosphere because they produce organic chemicals which other organisms, the consumers, are dependent on. So uh, autotrophs in general use carbon dioxide. So remember carbon dioxide is a gas. This can't be used directly for energy. It must be converted to something like a chemical energy, a solid. Now, some of them use other inorganic molecules, and what they do is take those gases and other inorganic molecules and make organic chemicals, which can be used to extract the energy out of them. Now, most all plants are what's called photoautotrophs. So photoautotrophs is kind of an expansion of the autotroph, meaning that they use light to, uh, they use light energy in order to do this right here. So they use uh, the carbon dioxide or inorganic molecules to create their organic chemicals. Well, where's the energy coming from to get this done, right? So get this, they use light energy. So that's where the photo comes from. Now there's a number of organisms, not just plants, that can undergo photosynthesis, which are autotrophs. Okay, we already know plants are, but there are some cyanobacteria. Remember, cyanobacteria are thought to be the origin of the chloroplast. And then we have uh, algae. So um, algae can be multicellular or unicellular. Uh, both of them uh, can potentially uh, conduct photosynthesis purple sulfur bacteria. So there's some bacteria that can photosynthesize. And then other unicellular eukaryotes, which may be in this the protist category. Now, as opposed to, there are what's called heterotrophs. We are actually heterotrophs. Heterotrophs require um, the ingestion or taking in of organic molecules from other organisms. So heterotrophs are kind of dependent on autotrophs for food in some manner. Now, of course, um, as opposed to autotrophs being the producers, the heterotrophs are the consumers of the biosphere. So they're gonna eat other living organisms, including plants. Now, some heterotrophs can uh, eat or consume dead organic material, or of course, um, feces would be on, in that particular category. These would be specifically called decomposers. Now, almost all heterotrophs, including us, uh, we depend on the photoautrophs for food and of course, the oxygen. Now, it's not plants that produce the majority of the oxygen in the biosphere. It's actually algae. 
Okay, so algae are, are uh, a group of protists, uh, which are really the main producers of oxygen in the bio. All right, so photosynthesis, like you, we already discussed, it's the process of converting light energy to chemical energy for, for food, right? So uh, organisms that can photosynthesize can produce their own food, their own autrophs. Um, now, chloroplasts are the, where this occurs. Now, other organisms, if they're unicellular, it's just the whole organism that can photosynthesize. Remember, chloroplast is just an organelle in a eukaryotic organism, so it's, it's a component within the cell. Now, it's thought that they were evolved from a photosynthetic bacteria, specifically a, a cyanobacteria. Now, there's three sources of evidence that suggest this. First of all, chloroplasts have their own DNA, and it's circular DNA as uh, very similar to the prokaryotes, like bacteria. And they have their own ribosomes. Okay, so the function of the ribosomes, as you remember from chapter six, are to synthesize proteins. Of course, um, if they were an organism previously, they would need to produce uh, proteins. And um, pr proteins are actually produced in the chloroplast, but they're mainly the proteins that are involved in photosynthesis. It's more efficient, more efficient to make the proteins in the chloroplast if they're required by the chloroplast. And then they have an inner and outer membrane, very similar to uh, some types of bacteria that have an inner and outer membrane. So these are the type, the three sources of evidence which suggest that the chloroplast originated from a, a bacteria, and in this case, it would be a cyanobacterium. Now, the structural organization of chloroplast allow for the chemical reactions of photosynthesis to occur there. So uh, from chapter six, we discussed the structural organization of the chloroplast, but you might not have recognized the significance of it in terms of photosynthesis. So we're gonna kind of review that now. now. The chloroplast, again, Let's look at the structure of the chloroplast. This is the site where photosynthesis occurs in uh, multicellular organisms, okay? So let's look at the structure. So um, just a little review. Remember the chloroplast? This shows a chloroplast here, and the chloroplasts are gonna be inside, specifically the mesophyll cells of plants. And um, if we look at this, we've got uh, the chloroplast inside a mesophyll cell, and this shows basically the surface of a leaf. So remember, it's going to be the green structures of plants, not the, the stems, right? So the green flat structures, which increase surface area, which allow for more efficient photosynthesis to occur. Well, on the surface of this, this would be the epidermis, okay? So this shows a cross-section of the leaf. In the epidermis, we have these, um, these specialized cells which open and close and allow air to pass through, specifically gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen. So this is where the carbon dioxide goes into the plant and the oxygen comes out of the plant. Looking at uh, the chloroplast again, so if you remember, we have the outer membrane and the inner membrane of the chloroplast, and then in between the inner membrane and the outer membrane are the, is the intermembrane space. And then there's a semi-fluid substance inside the inner membrane in which the thylakoids are kind of floating around in. That's called the stroma. So that would be analogous to the cytoplasm in just in general a cell, right? Inside the plant cell and inside the animal cell. However, it's called the stroma inside the chloroplast. And inside the chloroplast are stacks of thylakoids. So individual um, flattened sacs are the thylakoids, and then a stack is called a granum, right? So this shows an electron, a transmission electron micrograph of a chloroplast. So you can see the stacks and you can see they're all connected. Um, all of these thylakoids have uh, what's called the thylakoid membrane. And then inside the thylakoids are the thylakoid space. Now, these structures, the thylakoids, the thylakoid membrane, the thylakoid space, and the stroma are going to be very important when we talk about the details of photosynthesis. So it's important to remember kind of what we're dealing with here. So this kind of gives us an overview. Remember a broad um, kind of outside of the box looking at the chloroplast. Now we're going to be looking into the chloroplast when we get into the details of photosynthesis. Now, 
the overview, the chemical reaction of photosynthesis really is a, it's a series of redox reactions very similar to those that happen, um, and of course light uh, extraction of, of uh, electrons from the light into the pigment cells, or the pigment molecules. Now, uh, it's very similar to cellular respiration, except it's really the reverse direction, and the source of energy or the type of energy is different. So um, if you just reversed the, the reaction, right, the chemical reaction for cellular respiration, remember the uh, reactants for cellular respiration were glucose, C6H12O6, or oxygen and water. Well, water is produced, right? So glucose and oxygen. And then um, energy is, is, uh, is released during this process. Now, for photosynthesis, energy is required, right? So remember, cellular respiration is an exergonic process. Well, if we're going to reverse it, then that makes photosynthesis an endergonic process. So this is the process of synthesizing things. So this is an endergonic process or an anabolic process. So energy must be input in order for it to proceed. And the energy, of course, is coming from light. So if we combine carbon dioxide with water and light energy, we can produce, or not us, but plants and other things that can photosynthesize can produce glucose, oxygen, and uh, water. So we're going to kind of look at this a little bit more in detail in the next couple segments. However, let's take an overview. Now, um, in order to get the process started, the chloroplast actually split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And it's from the splitting of water where oxygen comes from, right? So once water is split, oxygen is produced. So we kind of depend on the splitting of water for our oxygen. Okay, so, and then uh, of course, this um, releases electrons uh, in the form of hydrogen. And then ultimately, um, all of these hydrogens and electrons are going to combine um, with other uh, atoms to produce sugar. And of course, the oxygen is going to be released. But in order to produce the sugar, carbon dioxide must go in. Now, let's look at this, um, the reactants in the products and where everything is going. So if we look at carbon dioxide, so remember carbon dioxide must come in. This is a gas, but it's going to be converted to chemical energy. So the carbon is going to be um, what's called fixed, right? So from it's going to be fixed from carbon dioxide into glucose. So this shows glucose right here, C6H12O6. And then the oxygen from the carbon dioxide basically goes to producing sugar and uh, reproducing more water. And then, of course, water is split. And when water is split, this is where the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from. So this oxygen will be released through the stomata in the plant leaves. And at the same time, carbon dioxide will enter the plant leaves. And then the hydrogens and electrons from water go to uh, producing the glucose and the additional water. So again, we're going to look at the details of this process in the next two segments. But let's look at the review of or overview. Now, again, it's a redox process similar to aerobic respiration. However, it's the reverse direction. So um, the basically water here is oxidized and carbon dioxide is going to be reduced. So remember, um, to track something and you try to identify something that is reduced, you want to look for the addition of hydrogens. So um, if we look at carbon dioxide, it has no hydrogens. However, it's going to, the carbons are going to gain hydrogens and the oxygen will eventually gain hydrogens when, when water is formed. But uh, the carbon forms the glucose. So if the carbon dioxide is reduced, then the, um, the water is going to be oxidized. This is endergonic, so energy must be required to input and get the process to proceed. And the energy comes from light. Now here we can see, similar to what we saw uh, when we we're talking about redox processes, we see the carbon dioxide is reduced. You can see that the hydrogens are added and then the water becomes oxidized. Basically, the hydrogens are lost. So there are two stages of photosynthesis.
the light reactions and the Kelvin cycle. So let's look at the light reactions and then we'll look at the Kelvin cycle. We're not going to look at the details. The details will come in the next two segments. However, they are dependent on one another. So the light reactions, again, this shows the chloroplast here. The light reactions occur in the thylakoid membrane. Okay, so here we see a granum. These are stacks of thylakoids, and they're made up of thy thylakoid membrane, and then inside the thylakoid membrane is the thylakoid space. So um, the thylakoids are green in the membrane because they have uh, the chlorophyll molecules, which are the pigment molecules which absorb light energy. Okay, so basically the, the, the pigment molecules, uh, they harvest the light. And then basically the electrons from the light or photons are going to be extracted from that to excite these electrons and then of course eventually produce ATP. Um, so water goes in, it becomes oxygen comes out and then during this process uh, we have some electron an electron carrier it's called NADP plus. So it's very similar to NAD plus however there's a phosphate attached to it. So NADP plus becomes reduced to NADPH. See, you can see the addition of a hydrogen. And then ADP plus inorganic phosphate will be combined to make ATP. So during the light reactions, light is harvested, water is split, oxygen is released, and ATP and NADPH are produced. Okay, it's this ATP and the NADPH that drive the Kelvin cycle. Okay, so the light reactions are basically getting and making the energy. The energy is used the glucose. Okay, so this involves the Kelvin cycle. So this kind of shows the relationship between the light reactions and the Kelvin cycle. So the Kelvin cycle depends on the light reactions for the ATP and the NADPH. The Kelvin cycle uh, fixes the carbon from carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide will come in as oxygen is going out. And it's a cycle. It's a continuous process. So basically, it's going to use the ATP and then reoxidize the NADPH, which will then be reused in the light reactions, okay, in order sugars. Now, it produces very simple sugar. So what's actually released during the Kelvin cycle is called G3P. You might be familiar with it from when we were talking about cellular respiration. It's called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So remember, it's that ending product in the energy investment phase of the, uh, the uh, glycolysis. Well, here it's used to actually build sugars instead of breaking them down. Now, um, before we talk about the details, we want to talk about what um, the nature of sunlight is. So we know it's it's light, right? So, but what? How does it work? So it is actually called electromagnetic energy, or electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so. The nature of light can be put on, um, I guess, a scale, if you will, okay? It's called the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. Now, uh, light travels in waves, and they're rhythmic, okay? So it's still a regular um, wave-like fashion. Sometimes the waves shorten, sometimes the wave lengthen. So um, sunlight or the light part can act like particles, and these particles are called photons, so they can be analogous to, I guess, electrons. Um, now, the wavelength is the distance between the crests of the waves, okay? So this shows a rhythmic wave right here, and you can see the, the crest is right here is basically the highest point. And then we have a lower point. But the distance between, this would be the trough right here, the distance between the, tr the crests are the wavelength. So the wavelength can be longer or it can be shorter. If it's longer, that means the crests are further apart. If it's shorter, that means the crests are closer together. Now there's a relationship between wavelength and energy. If we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, Okay, this shows visible light. However, there is light that is not visible. Okay, so um, if we look at this, these are wavelengths right here. So this is 380 nanometers, 450 nanometers, all the way to 750 nanometers. These are the lengths 
of, of um, the wavelengths, right, of visible light. Okay, so remember visible light is basically the, the, the rainbow that you see, the different colors of light that you actually see. So the longer the wavelength, right, so the lower the energy. Okay, so as the wavelength gets longer, there's lower energy associated with it. So there's an inverse relationship between wavelength and energy. So as you go to the shorter wavelength, so that means the crests are closer together, that means it's higher energy. So you can see we have the higher energy side of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we have the lower energy side of the electromagnetic spectrum. So on the lower energy side is the reds and the oranges, right, in terms of what we actually see. And then further, what we don't see are the infrared, the microwaves, and the radio waves. Okay, so these are very low energy. If we go the other way to the higher energy, this is where the blues and the violets are. If we go beyond that to what we don't see, this is, this is the dangerous light. Okay, so these um, are very dangerous. Uh, this is energy, too high of energy that we, can, we can't handle this. So we have UV, we have X-rays and gamma rays. Okay, so these can cause, especially X-rays and gamma rays, they can cause damage to our cells. Okay, so this shows the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, it's important to know this because um, now inside plants, we already mentioned there are pigments, and I mentioned chlorophyll. Well, there's other types of pigments. These are like receptors, right? So they detect the light and they absorb this light. So they're going to absorb the visible light. And again, like I said, there are different pigments that different, absorb different wavelengths of light. And this is why we see the different colors. And why we see this is because the wavelengths that are not absorbed by the pigment are actually reflected or transmitted. Okay, so it's the reflected or transmitted light that we actually see. So when we see green, so if the plant appears green, that's the color, that's the wavelength or the, the color of the wavelength that is not being absorbed. Okay, it's being emitted. So again, leaves appear green because the chlorophyll is reflecting that green light. It's not absorbing that green light. So if we look at this right here, light is going to travel through the chloroplast, well, through the cell and through the chloroplast and um, different wavelengths of light, which are associated with visible light colors, right, um, are going to be absorbed. And again, whichever ones are not absorbed are going to be reflected. So basically, um, the... the chlorophyll, if it's mostly green, right, so the chlorophyll pigment absorbs all the other colors but reflects green okay so it doesn't absorb the wavelength that's associated with the green color Uh, wavelengths and, and uh, what can be absorbed and uh, transmitted can be measured by a what's called a spectrophotometer it measures a pigment's ability to uh, absorb certain wavelengths. So what the spectrophotometer does is basically sends light through the pigments and then measures what's transmitted at each wavelength. So you can determine what a particular pigment can absorb and what it emits. And it's shown as a curve, right? So you get um, you get a, a transmitted, a percent transmittance so that you get, or absorbance so that you can um, uh, basically draw a curve showing uh, the relationship. This represents an absorption spectrum for various pigments. So here we can see what's absorbed. So the higher the peak there, that means the more absorption. And then of course, the lower the curve here means less absorption. Now, um, and this is versus wavelength. Okay, so here we have the purples and the wavelengths associated with the violet and the blue and the green and the yellow and the reds. So if we track chlorophyll A, you can see it absorbs highest, okay, but it absorbs pretty well in the violets and the blue. And then as we get to the green, it absorbs the least. So this is what's emitted. So this is why you see green, 
right? It's absorbing the other colors. It's also absorbing more of the orange and the red here. Now, chlorophyll B is another type of chlorophyll molecule, which, which basically emits the greenish color as well. So chlorophyll A is going to emit a little bit more bluish, and then chlorophyll B will be a little bit more greenish on the greenish side. And it, it, you can see that it absorbs the blues and the violets and, of course, the reds and the oranges as well. And then we have the carotenoids. These are accessory pigments. Well, chlorophyll B is also an accessory pigment, but there's then the uh, carotenoids, which absorb at similar levels. So they are gonna absorb the violets and the blues. However, um, they do not absorb the yellows and the reds. So they're gonna appear, so they're gonna emit the more yellows and reds, right? So you're gonna see those. And that's why you see the leaves turning uh, well, the part of, partly why why you see leaves turning um, yellow and red uh, when it gets cold. What happens is the chlorophyll gets degraded in the cold weather. And then what you see are what's left, right? So the cold weather affects the absorption, the ability of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B to absorb the, the light, okay? So then the um, carotenoids are what you see. Um, absorbing light and then of course emitting. Now there's uh, what's called an absorption spectrum and an an action spectrum shows the relative effectiveness of basically the, the amount of photosynthesis. So here we see the rate of a photosynthesis measured by the production of uh, oxygen. Okay, so increased oxygen, so more photosynthesis, uh, these wavelengths versus wavelength. And then less photosynthesis where there's the wavelength associated with green. And be, it's because the light is, is reflected rather than absorbed. You want it to be absorbed, okay, um, to have better photosynthesis. So at these wavelengths, there's more efficient uh, photosynthesis versus these wavelengths right here. In the two, and we, we see this, we see that the action spectrum, which is highlighted in this graph right here down at the bottom, which I'm kind of tracing, is much broader than the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. And it's because the, the accessory pigments like chlorophyll B and the carotenoids are going to broaden that spectrum. And the difference between the chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, so we see chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, the this absorption spectrum is quite different between them. So chlorophyll A absorbs more in the violet region, um, where chlorophyll B not so much. And then, of course, I mentioned that chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B will emit a little bit more blue versus the chlorophyll um, A. Um, and this is due to the, there's a, stru a slight structural difference between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. This represents uh, a chlorophyll molecule in general, okay? So chlorophyll, this represents actually chlorophyll A. So we have this very large porphyrin ring. So this is, this is what actually absorbs the light. And this is called the head of the molecule. And the tail of the molecule is going to be a hydrocarbon tail. And remember, it's associated with a membrane, specifically the thylakoid membrane. So it's going to be embedded in the membrane, and it's embedded because it has this hydrophobic portion. Um, even though all of this is somewhat hydrophobic, you can see there's a lot of carbons and hydrogens here. And then the nitrogens are kind of um, complexed with a magnesium in the center. Now, the difference between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B is that chlorophyll A has a methyl group at this position right here. And chlorophyll B has an aldehyde at this position right here. So that's the only difference between them two, which caused such a, a difference in their absorption spectrum. So, um, like I mentioned, the accessory pigments, they're called carotenoids, and that in includes those pigments which are going to emit lights like yellow and orange and reds. Um, so, again, they do not absorb at the same uh, wavelengths, so the same colors or uh, wavelengths of light that the uh, chlorophyll A and B do. Now, um, these, again, contribute to the broadening of the action spectrum. Um, and then they can broaden, basically allow photosynthesis even in cold weathers, right? So they can, they can still absorb light. Some of them actually absorb excessive light and actually protect the cell from the UV light, um, from not just the visible light, but the, the dangerous, uh, uh, the dangers of, of this light, right? So we have, um, it, 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 
the light can produce uh, molecules which can damage cells. So in summary, I talked about the trophic categories, a little bit overview of photosynthesis. And before we get into the details of photosynthesis in the next two segments, we really had to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum and how light um, works um, in waves and, and the, you know, about the photons. And then I discussed the difference between the action and the absorption spectrum for the various pigments that are in plants. All right, so I think we're ready for the details of photosynthesis.